Well, good evening and welcome to our midweek Bible study. We are in the Gospel of Matthew. We're in chapter 9. And, you know, just the times that we're living in, people are hopeless. People are desperate. They're living in really, really rough times. And, you know, I know God has a plan in all this. I know he knows what he's doing. I know he's in full control. But sometimes it gets hard. And it gets even harder if you're not thinking on the Lord. So tonight I titled the message, Deliverance Out of Hopeless and Desperate Situations. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the things that we can continue to learn from it. Father, I just pray for your anointing tonight, that you would anoint our ears, our minds, our spirit, and our soul, God. Lord, that we would understand what your word is saying to us this evening. Go before us, bless our time, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Matthew chapter 9, we're going to pick up our study from last time in verse 18. <clears throat> While Jesus spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did the disciples. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. When Jesus came into the ruler's house, and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing. I mean, they would hire professional wailers that would just wail and cry out. He said to them, make room, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. <clears throat> but when the crowd was put outside, Jesus went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went out into all that land. Now, at the beginning, we studied these accounts showing Jesus' authority over sickness. But we're seeing that there are a whole lot more than just physical healings. The calming of the wind and waves on the Sea of Galilee. I mean, it showed Jesus had authority over nature. That's what gets me about this climate change, right? God's got the, the control over everything. God knows what he is doing. And then we saw Jesus' authority over demons, which is more of a spiritual issue than a physical issue. Probably the greatest of them was the tie between the forgiveness of sin and the healing of the paralyzed man in chapter 9. <clears throat> Now, the reason why Matthew used these specific stories was to show that Jesus came not so much to heal us of our physical diseases. He came to cure us of our sin so we could then be used in his service. This insight gives us a clue for interpreting everything else that we're going to see in chapters 8 to chapter 10. Matthew reveals what he was actually writing about when he quoted Isaiah 53, 4. He took our infirmities and carried our diseases. Now, some claim Matthew missed the text, or misused it rather, because it's about the Messiah bearing sin rather than about healing diseases. But you know what? Matthew knew exactly what Isaiah 53 was talking about. When he quotes Isaiah, he's saying what's really shown in these healings is Jesus' ability to take away our sin and to restore us to spiritual health. <clears throat> the first was about discipleship. 
those who say they want to follow Jesus, but they were more concerned about the things in this life. How many people do I know like that today? Therefore, they don't follow him. And you know what happens? They stay in their sin. They never get the forgiveness of their sins. The second concern, Matthew's calling and Jesus' statement that he had, not, <clears throat> he had come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Like the paralytic. I mean, Matthew was healed. I'm talking about Matthew, the writer of his gospel here. But he was healed of sin. The key is when Matthew was healed, he showed it immediately by what? By trying to bring his friends to Jesus as the Savior. He went out and started evangelizing, man. He began with his friends. I mean, it's very significant that chapters 8, 9, and 10 end with Jesus doing what? He's commissioning the disciples to work of getting the gospel out. I mean, we're talking about evangelism, evangelizing, which is a way of saying is the work that true discipleship will lead you to. True discipleship will lead you to evangelizing, telling others about Jesus. <clears throat> if we have left everything to follow Jesus, just like the guys did, the disciples. And if we've been received by Jesus and have been forgiven of our sins as they were, then we will tell others about Jesus. We won't be ashamed and we won't be afraid. We're not going to just keep it to ourselves and carry on with life. Let me go a little further. We will not be content until the entire world has been told that Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that he is the savior of the human race, all mankind. <clears throat> we now come to more healings. The raising of a synagogue ruler's daughter who had died and the healing of a woman who had an issue of blood. Now, Mark and Luke's gospel also record these stories, and they give a little more detail, where Matthew gives a condensed version, if you will. The first story is of Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue. Here, Jesus is teaching about fasting, <laughs> and this ruler of the synagogue comes in, and he asks Jesus to go with him and to raise his daughter from the dead. I can't imagine that. I can't even imagine that. Just sitting there, you're teaching about something, and here comes a guy and says, hey, I need you to come with me. My daughter just died. I want you to raise her up. Can you imagine what everybody's thinking? Ah, but this is Jesus. This is God, the Son of God. You know, in studying the scriptures, the word ruler just about always means a ruler of the synagogue. In the Gospel of Mark chapter 5, we learn this man's name is Jairus. Mark says at the time the ruler first came to Jesus, his daughter had not yet died, but she died before Jesus reached her. We have the account in Mark chapter 5 verse 35, it says this, while Jesus was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Now you might remember earlier studying the healing of the Roman centurion servant. We read of the faith of that centurion. He believed Jesus could heal his servant. He told him, you don't even have to come to my house. Just say the words and I know he'll be healed. Can you imagine if every believer or every born again believer would have that kind of faith? There'd be a whole lot of stress, a lot less stress in the world, a lot less desperation and hopelessness. 
I want you to notice the faith of this synagogue ruler. He said to Jesus, my daughter has just died, but come lay your hand on her and she will live. That's amazing, man. That's heavy duty right there. His faith may not have been as strong as the centurion's, but I gotta tell you, man, at some point in the story, knowing his daughter had died, still the dude trusted Jesus. He trusted Jesus. What's interesting is this ruler of the synagogue was from the same religious leaders who were jealous of Jesus. I mean, they got hostile with Jesus and now they're trying to destroy Jesus. But here we get an idea why Jairus appealed to a man his leaders rejected. The guy was desperate. Here, his daughter is dying or already dead. And he had nowhere else to turn, no one else to go to. This was it. This was the last straw. Either Jesus does that or it's done. Yastuvo, it's finished. Desperation might not have been the best of motives, but it did drive him to Jesus. And you know what? I got to tell you, that's all that mattered. That's all that mattered. I believe sometimes God has to let us scrape the bottom of the trash can before we can realize how desperate we really are and how much we need him in our lives. It's been the case for people throughout time. I mean, they might not have come to Jesus for any other reason, but something in their lives made them desperate. Maybe you're feeling hopeless tonight. Maybe you're in a situation that is desperate. Come to Jesus. Come before your Lord. Trust him. Know that he knows what he is doing. You see, what happened is they came to Jesus and found he didn't come down on them for their inadequate or poor motives. Instead, he met their needs. He met their needs. If you have a need that no one else is able to, to meet, turn to Jesus. Turn to him if you feel the burden of your sin and if you want forgiveness of that sin. There's no one who can forgive sin. There's no one who can free you from sin's burden but Jesus Christ. The second story is that of a woman with an issue of blood. Now, here also, we have an act of desperation. It was being desperate that this woman went to Jesus. We don't have her name. God knows who she is. But she's introduced as a desperate person because she had been bleeding for 12 years. The Gospel of Luke, the writer Luke adds in Luke 8, she went to all the doctors and no one could heal her. That's it. Now she's going to die. It's important for us to understand her condition because it obviously illustrates our own desperate condition because of our sin. We're in the same boat, man. <laughs> First, she was unclean. The woman was suffering from excessive menstrual bleeding. Whatever the source, the bleeding would have weakened her. I mean, she would have been anemic as well as subject to other diseases. And she would have been considered ceremonial, unclean by the Jews. As remember the leper was that Jesus healed in, in chapter eight here of Matthew's gospel. The condition of a woman subject to bleeding like this and how she was to be treated is recorded in Leviticus chapter 15. Secondly, she was isolated. People couldn't have any contact with a menstruating woman 
without being made unclean by their contact with her. In fact, the law actually taught. They couldn't lie on a bed where she had lain. They couldn't even sit in a chair where she had sat. No one could touch her and she couldn't touch anyone. Imagine that. Third, she was incurable. I mean, give me a break. Luke is a doctor. <laughs> Dr. Luke, he's a physician that wrote the Gospel of Luke. He's a Gentile. The other three authors of the Gospels were Jews. He makes this clearer than the other Gospels when he explains that no one could heal her. Mark Gospel says, in spite of her having seen many doctors, instead of getting better, the poor lady got worse. I mean, when we put the story of the synagogue ruler's doctor and the woman who suffered from bleeding together, guys, I'm going to tell you tonight, we have a great picture of every person that has ever lived or will live. You see, apart from the healing grace of Jesus Christ, we're done, man. We're finished. According to the law, the dead were as unclean as menstru menstruating women and lepers. They couldn't be touched. That's why Matthew makes the point, Jesus threw it all down. <laughs> Jesus threw down, man. He took the dead girl by the hand. And she rose up. Now, as far as the woman was concerned, she was bleeding to death, if, even if she wasn't yet dead. As for being incurable, the condition of the dead girl and the condition of the woman, they were both beyond hope. But I'm here to tell you tonight, they were not beyond hope in Jesus. They were not beyond hope. We're told the woman's contact with Jesus healed her from that very moment. That very moment she touched the hem of his robe. Boom! She was healed. I love it. As soon as Jesus took the dead girl by the hand, as soon as he took her hand, she rose up, being raised from the death that held her. Man, you got to love it. You got to love it. It spoke of the truth of the resurrection. That yes, every one of us are going to die. You know what? I did a little research on death. Check it out. 10 out of 10 of us are going to die. <laughs> Unless Jesus comes at the rapture. Amen. It's the only way we're going to escape death. But in Christ, do you know that we are all going to rise again? I'm talking to born again believers. We are going to rise again. You see, you might be unclean. You might be isolated. You could even be incurable. But there's always hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. There's always hope. See, this is what I love about our Lord. No one is too unclean. No one is too isolated. And no one is too hopeless for Jesus to save. He has proven that he can even raise the dead. Jesus said, anyone who comes to me, I will in no wise kick out. He won't do it. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. He's waiting for you. When he died on that cross 2,000 years ago, he died in your place so that you could receive forgiveness of sin and have your name written in the book of life and have all eternity in heaven with all the rest of us. Now, I don't know if you're thinking, well, Rick's going to be there. I don't know if I want to be there. <laughs> Come on, man. It's going to be a kick. It's going to be awesome when we get to heaven. The point of these stories is exactly what Jesus does in everyone who is saved from sin. It's what he's done for us as 
believers, born again Christians. You see, sin makes us unclean. Sin contaminates us. Not one of us can come before the purity of God's presence until our sin is dealt with. None of us. You can pray all you want. It's not even going to hit the ceiling. You'll never make it to heaven until your sin is dealt with. Then at that point, you can boldly come before God's throne of grace. When Isaiah saw the Lord seated on his throne in heaven, it blew the dude's mind. <laughs> Isaiah, he cried out, man, I am undone for I am a man of unclean lips. Man, the things I say out of these lips peel paint off the wall. And I live among a people of unclean lips. He trembled before God until an angel touched his lips with a coal from the altar. And he told him, Isaiah, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Sin isolates us. It keeps us from God, which is actually the worst thing about sin. It isolates us from people. It creates hurt. It creates hard feelings. It creates misunderstandings between the races in the world here, between individuals, even between members of our own family. That's what sin does. Isaiah wrote of our isolation from God in Isaiah 59, verse 2. He says, but your inequities, it's another word for sins, has separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. Guys, I'm here to tell you our condition is totally hopeless apart from God's saving grace. Think about that. Nothing can be more hopeless than death. And according to Ephesians chapter two, we're described as being already dead in our sins. Yeah, the walking dead. <laughs> That's us spiritually. Paul writing to the Ephesians said in Ephesians two, verses four to seven, he said, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Yes, God loves you. Even when we were dead in trespasses, man, we were doing our own trips. Come on. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Guys, we have no greater picture of the love, the grace, the power of the resurrection and of salvation than in these two stories, these two accounts of healings. Look at verse 27 here in Matthew chapter nine. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him crying out and saying, son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. According to your faith. You can't just mouth the words and say, I have faith. You have to have faith. You have to believe and trust that God can do whatever God wants to do. God's in control. Well, you guessed it. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them saying, see that you, that no one knows it. <laughs> I love that. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. You know what? That's what happens. I mean, when we give our lives to Christ, we want everybody to know. 
We want everybody to go to heaven. We want to tell everybody, our family, our friends, everybody about Jesus. Notice this is the first time we see the use of the title Son of David. Son of David. It's used here and in other places of the Messiah. God had promised David in 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 to 16. God said, David, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, when you die, I will set up your seed after you, your children and grandchildren after you, your descendants, who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, he shall be my son. If he commits inequity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Here it is. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Notice God said that twice. Whenever anything is said twice in the Bible, it's confirmation. It will happen. Well, that's going to happen through Jesus. David was of the tribe of Judah. Even though Joseph and Mary, Joseph wasn't Jesus' father. God, God is. God the Father. But Joseph and Mary were both from the tribe of Judah. That way, Jesus couldn't be said that he was tied in with another tribe. It was totally the tribe of Judah. These blind men were confessing Jesus as a Messiah. It was their faith in Jesus as a Messiah that actually led them to cry out to him. Hey, Jesus! Jesus! And he stopped and he healed them. According to Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6, the Messianic age was understood to be a time as this. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears, ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Now granted, they might not have been sure of their faith being in the right place before they cried out, but it was their only chance. These dudes were blind and they were desperate. They wanted to see. Their condition was hopeless. And yet Jesus turned to them. Are you guys getting a picture here? He called them, he questioned them, and then he healed them. I mean, these stories teach when Jesus saves people from their sin, they portray our spiritual condition, that we are all unclean, that we are all isolated, that we are all hopeless, that we are dead in our sins. They show to be saved from sin when we need the forgiving and saving grace of God. And the only way you can find that is in Jesus Christ. He's the one who died on the sins for you. The last story is unique because due to the man's demon possession, he couldn't talk. But after the demon was cast out, he could talk. Look at verse 32 as we wrap up. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a man, mute and demon-possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never seen like this in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He cast out demons by the ruler of the demons. <laughs> I cannot believe these guys, man. Give me a break. Pharisees, teachers of the law, and he's, he's, miracles are being done, and it's being done through Satan. Are you kidding me? I want to close with three observations. First, these miracles should have led them to faith in Jesus as their Messiah. They should have. 
This is the groundwork for Jesus' defense of being the Messiah to John the Baptist's disciples in chapter 11, verses 2 to 6. The disciples came and said, John the Baptist sent us. He wants to know if you're the one, <laughs> if you're the Messiah. Jesus said, you tell him what you're seeing. The blind see, the lame walk, uh, the deaf hear, those who can't speak, speak, the dead are raised. And blessed is he who's not offended in me. That's what Jesus said. We'll get there in a, a couple weeks. Second, the Pharisees continually spoke and came against Jesus. They continually did. I mean, we saw the sad beginning of their opposition earlier when they called his claim to forgive sin blasphemy. Then they criticized him for eating with sinners. Man, I eat with sinners every day. <laughs> it's amazing to me. In the story of raising of Jairus' daughter, they laughed at him. And here they do the worst thing of all, being helpless to deny the miracle they just witnessed. They attribute it to Satan's power. You know what it did? It showed themselves to be closer to Satan than Jesus. That's what it showed. Third, lastly, we have the testimonies of those who were healed. They had experienced an incredible deliverance. And you know what? They could not keep silent about it. They couldn't hold it in, man. They immediately went out and they told what Jesus had done in their lives. You see, you and I have been delivered from death by the blood of Jesus Christ. The question that I want to leave with you this evening, why in the world do you keep silent about it? You can't, man. You've got to let people know. It's called the good news of the gospel. We are compelled, we are challenged to be declaring this good news. People are dying and going to hell. Our own neighbors, our family members, our BFFs, <laughs> our friends. I, you know, if I was to ask you, how many people have you won to Christ since you became a born again believer? What would be your answer? I mean, you literally sat there and prayed with them the sinner's prayer and they gave their lives to Christ and received that forgiveness of sin and had their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life and became a born-again believer. How many since you've been a born-again believer have you prayed with? It's heart-searching, man. Remember, as born-again believers, we've got the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. It's all gonna be revealed. Let's get on it. Let's get on it. People need to know there's life in Christ. Without that, it's eternity in hell. We will never see him again, ever. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the things you continue to teach us, Lord. Father, I pray for everyone that is watching. God, I ask for a personal conviction from the power of the Holy Spirit. that they would have the boldness, that they would have the strength, that they would have the guts to tell others about you, Jesus. You died for all mankind. You did your part, now it's our part to let them know that so that they could have eternity in heaven. Father, go before us, Lord. Make us the people we need to be in you and get on fire for you, God and let others know of that blessed hope that we have within us, that one day soon you're coming for us and this will all be over. Lord God, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. Enable us through the power of the Holy Spirit that you have graciously indwelled us with, and we ask these things in the name of your Son, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. 
God bless you guys. I will see you Sunday as we continue in the Psalms. Or, yeah, I'll see you in the air, man. Hopefully, Lord willing, he's coming very soon. Are you guys ready? Vamos para la casa. Let's go. Muy pronto, señor. It's about all I know to my Spanish. <laughs> I love you guys. I'll see you then. Blessings.